Well, hello, City Church. Yeah, good to see you. Good to hear you. And welcome to all those watching on the live stream, on Facebook, on YouTube, like Caitlin, Caitlin enjoys doing. I'm glad that you could join us too and be part of the family that is from all over the world and is watching from different places around the world. It's fun to be an international family that God has adopted into his family. That's a really, really good thing. And those of you who were here last week, either in this room or watching on the live stream, may remember that the City Kids group led us in worship, and it was a party. Uh, and so for those of you who weren't there, can we maybe get a, a little video clip of uh, what went on then? Is that uh, possible to show that? One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, Now watch her go. Yeah, get down, girl. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, they shook everything up. They turned the whole room on its side by their enthusiasm. But the words they were singing were really great uh, as well. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. And actually, that's a great intro into what we're going to be talking about today. Because we're continuing our series called Good News. Because there's more than enough bad news going on out there, right? And we could all be encouraged by hearing some good news from God. And God has good news for us. And we're going to look at how God goes about changing the world, one person at a time. And that is through the power of the gospel. And that's what gospel means, good news. And God's good news has unmatched and uh, transformative power. It transformed a guy who came to be known as the Apostle Paul, and it made him from a confirmed legalist, keeping all the picky little rules, into a freedom fighter, fighting for freedom, the freedom that God gives. And it literally changed the world. This message changed the world, is changing the world still, and it could turn your life upside down, even if you've been going to church for your entire life. That's the power of the gospel, and we're going to dig into this. So be careful. This is high explosive. But we're going to explore the world-changing gospel of God's grace. And I've given my message today a bit of a provocative title. Uh, it may sound strange to you when first seeing it. I've called it circumcision versus crucifixion. Okay. That's going to need some unpacking. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul will walk us through this in the first two chapters of his letter to the Galatians. We're digging into this letter because uh, in this series, um, the Apostle Paul wanted to make something very clear to the people that he loved and that uh, in the church that he had planted in Galatia, the Roman province of Galatia. He, made, he took great pains in this letter that was sent to a group of churches in that region to let, the, let them know and to, to say specifically what the gospel, what the good news is and what it isn't. And he also identified the crucial importance of this message. He saw it as literally life and death. It had life and death ramifications, eternal life and death ramifications. And also that bled into, in a literal sense, the flesh and blood life of the apostle Paul. See, Paul identified this major battle that was going on at this time around this topic. It was a spiritual battle, 
And it was a battle for the hearts and souls of the people he loved in the church that he planted in the areas, uh, the area of Galatia. So Paul was very familiar with this battle. He'd been fighting this battle for years. And it actually left him literally bruised and bleeding on several occasions. It almost killed him more than once. So this was literally a life and death battle for Paul. And it was a battle between religious legalism and living a life of faith. Now, how does that lead to near-death experiences for the Apostle Paul? Well, hang in there. We'll get there. Um, so, yeah, this battle is, is something that all of us uh, need to enter into and are in the middle of, whether we know it or not. And you know, Paul believed passionately, and I'm joining him today in proclaiming this passionate message that was kind of core to his life and ministry, that everyone can break away from slavery to legalism and can live in the freedom of faith by connecting with the crucifixion of Christ. How does that work? Stay tuned. We're getting there. Now, you may be saying, you may be thinking in your, in your mind, in your heart, um, circumcision versus crucifixion. Neither of them sounds very appealing. <laughs> uh, should I leave now? Did I pick the wrong week to go to church? <laughs> yeah. And how are circumcision and crucifixion opposed to each other? What battle are they in? And how does a means of execution like crucifixion, lead to living in the freedom of faith? How does that lead to life? Very excellent questions. Very astute of you. Thank you for asking. Let's let Paul walk us through this. And the answers will, will come. Uh, these things will be made clear. So to help us do that, Paul rewinds. He goes back to... Uh, the, the beginning to when he was actually fighting as a general on the wrong side of this conflict, the opposite side of where he wound up. So he sets the stage for introducing this titanic battle that he was so invested in, that was so important to him, and is so important to us still today. He introduces this by going back to that time and letting us in on his transformation we're going to see Paul transformed. He writes in Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 13. He says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. He's talking to his friends in the churches that he planted in the region of Galatia. He had told them about this. My previous way of life, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my own people, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, there's that transformation point, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, there's the transformation. There's Paul getting a new calling to join a new team. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. So he responded to this transformational encounter that he had with Jesus, meeting him, the resurrected Jesus, on the road to Damascus and being transformed in, the, in that encounter. And he remembers how he originally was one of the, the high-ranking leaders in Judaism. And he was extremely religious, he was very legalistic, and he expressed it to the point of even persecuting Christians 
who were going a different way than the way that Judaism had taught him to go. You can read about this in Acts chapter 9. Because then God intervened in the person of Jesus, God's son. And Jesus showed Paul a totally different way of life. A major league paradigm shift, turning his life upside down. You know, even more so than the kids turned this room sideways. Uh, Paul's life was completely upended and transformed. A life of freedom from the slavery of his religious legalism. A life lived by faith. And Paul was completely transformed and amazed at God's grace to do that even to him who had been so horrible persecuting the church, persecuting Christians, men, women, children, even to death. And yet, God showed him grace and mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. God did that for Paul. And he dedicated the rest of his life to sharing what he had learned, what he had heard from Jesus. And, and God called him to preach this message of this life of faith to a completely different audience than he was used to, to the Gentiles, to all the non-Jews in the world. Now, this was a radical transformation. I mean, Paul was a rising star in Judaism. He was one of the, the top leaders and Judaism was the Jewish faith that had arisen in between the two Testaments, after the Old Testament was finished and before the New Testament began. There was a period of 400 years. And during that time, this uh, religious perspective, this approach of Judaism had arisen and come together. And Paul was one of the top dogs. He was a rock star in Judaism. Everybody knew Paul. His name was Saul at that time. And this transformation was like the star player on your rugby team, uh, getting traded to your arch rival and then leading them to the, the World Cup. <laughs> Woo, not good. Yeah, so the, the Judaism team was not happy. They did not like what was going on with formerly Saul, now called Paul. But Paul's now connecting with his new team. And so he continues in Galatians 1, verses 18 and 19. He says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, which is the Greek uh, name, the Greek translation of Peter. Uh, Peter, the apostle, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And he goes up there, he gets acquainted with Cephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. But he's spending a couple weeks with Peter, getting to know the rest of the team. And uh, later, we find that Paul is accepted by the leaders of the church. It took a while. At first, they were just scared of him, because this is the guy who used to kill us. Now he says he wants to work with us. Eventually, they were able to see that, yes, this is sincere. And so, uh, Paul got accepted by the leaders. Galatians chapter 2, he says, After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. He liked to do uh, ministry together in teams. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation. God called him to do this. And meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders of the church the baby Christian church, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. So here you see Paul's calling being solidified. God's calling him into a totally new direction uh, to go and bring this message of freedom to the Gentiles. And Jesus had said to his followers, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, to everywhere else, 
to every nation on earth. And many of us are coming from all these different nations that Jesus was talking about. That this gospel has come to all these different nations that we represent. 67 different countries at my last count uh, that have been part of this church at some point uh, in the last few years. And that's beautiful. That's a fulfillment of what Jesus was talking to them about. Yeah, that's what I want. That's my dream is for this message to go out to every nation and people from every nation, tribe, people and language can grab a hold of it, can respond to God, can receive his love and can love him back and can pay that love forward into the lives of others. So, you know, Jesus had said, you'll be my witnesses and you will uh, be in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the gospel had already been brought to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. But Paul was one of those who God was calling to take it to the ends of the earth. That's part of what we were singing about earlier. Uh, thank you, Anushka, for leading us. Uh, lead me in your love to those around me. Uh, that's the heart desire that the Apostle Paul had. And as he's meeting with these leaders of the church, they agreed. They affirmed him as Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. Galatians 2, starting with verse 7, says, On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So there's that word coming up that we're going to dig into. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars of the church, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, symbol in the ancient world as it is now of friendship, affirmation. We're on the same team. We're together. We're connected. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me by Jesus. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So here Paul keeps using that word uh, that was terminology that was common in the Jewish mindset of the time. The circumcised referred to the Jews, the people who followed Judaism. They uh, circumcised every male child at eight days old, according to the law of Moses. Now, I'm not going to go into details about what this involved for uh, obvious reasons for anyone who knows what this is uh, in involving, uh, but it was a surgery on a very sensitive part of the male anatomy, and uh, it's commonly practiced today in many countries around the world. Uh, it's seen as a, a health benefit in many uh, countries around the world, uh, but this was at that time, in that place, this was a practice that set the Jews apart from all the other nations around them because they did not practice that. And so it was intended to be a physical picture of a spiritual reality, that these people were distinct from other nations who did not follow God. They were set apart from all the other peoples who were not dedicated to following God. And this was part of it. It indicated that they were called to bring the light of God to these other nations. That they were supposed to be a light. The prophets made this clear. Isaiah, you will bring the light to the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will put their hope, meaning the Messiah, Jesus. And the problem was the religious leaders of Judaism, during the development of Judaism, through that 400 years, they had twisted the meaning that was originally given to this practice. And they had turned it into a legalistic, binding rule that was like a weight on people, along with lots of other rules. During this period, they actually added more than 600 rules 
to the law of Moses that God had given. They were like, that's not good enough. We need more laws. We need more rules. We need lots of picky little rules that determine everything you do, including what you do with your spices. That You have to count up the number of cumin seeds that you have and, and tithe 10% of them. Just covering the law of Moses with piles of extra laws and rules. And th they also turned it into a, like a badge of honor. Like we are set apart. We are not like you nations. We are better than you are. <laughs> they believed that they were sinless because they followed all the rules, all the law of Moses. That that's how they were able to be free from sin and they believed that all the nations that didn't practice all these rules, including circumcision, they were the sinners. They were to be looked down upon. And even to be, you know, I, I don't associate with those people. I don't eat with them. You know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with women who do. Uh, so, you know, you guys are beneath us. And that was not God's intention. He never wanted them to be acting like that. But they had twisted it and distorted it into this hyper-religious, legalistic form of religion, which was not good. They believed their bloodline made them better. Uh, and the, the Gentile sinners were inferior to them. So circumcision came to be a defining practice for them in their culture, symbolizing their dedication to the law, to their, their commitment to religious legalism, elevating law keeping to their highest value. It became really an idol, replacing God. It was more important to keep the law than to have a relationship with God in their way of thinking. But Paul had received a different message. He had been a committed legalist. He had been one of their you know, leading lights preaching that message, that gospel. Yes, you need to obey the law in order to be connected to God. All of it keeping not only the written law of Moses, but also the oral tradition that the Judaism uh, religion had added on to the law of Moses, the extra 600 plus commands. And Paul had been keeping every one scrupulously. He thought he had to. He thought that's how you please God. That's how you become righteous. That's how you Take care of your sin as you follow all, every little aspect of the law. So by the time Jesus was born, with these hundreds of extra laws piled on top of God's laws, Jesus was upset. He was not happy about this. And he took the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, had the harshest words for them. He said, you whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Ooh. He didn't mince words with these guys. He said, you're blind guides leading the blind. He said, you strain out a gnat, a little tiny bug, and you swallow a camel. Like, you're getting it wrong, guys. It's not about religious legalism. It's not about keeping the law. And Jesus had set Paul free. He met Paul personally after he rose from the dead and he said to Paul, go, be free. <laughs> Live a different way of life. And Paul caught it and he was transformed and he started living it and preaching it. The gospel message had broken him out of the prison of religious legalism and set him free by faith. So now he's committed to preaching this gospel, the real gospel, the real good news. That other message isn't good news. Yeah, you gotta keep all these laws, including getting circumcised. Mm, no, doesn't sound like good news to me. Um, but now Paul's preaching this message and he's committed to seeing legalism resisted. So when he was in Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus, as he was talking about before, 
some people who had become followers of Jesus but were still connected, they couldn't let go of Judaism. It was still holding on to them, holding on to their hearts. They couldn't let go. And they were putting pressure on new Christians to say, no, you have to keep the full law of Moses, including circumcision. And Paul was not going along with this. He said, no, this is what I just got broken out of. I don't want people to go get locked back up in this prison. And so in Galatians 2, he says, yet not even Titus who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek, uncircumcised. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves again. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you, my friends in the churches in Galatia. So those who insisted that Christians needed to continue to follow all the law of Moses, including circumcision, they were known as Judaizers. And Paul called them false believers. He had harsh words for them too, just like Jesus did. He identified them as a threat to the truth of the gospel. And Paul said they were working against the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. And were trying to make new Christians slaves again to religious legalism. That's why he was resisting them so strongly. And, and this was a particular danger at that time. Because at the beginning, the entire church, everyone who was part of the church, was Jewish. I mean, Jesus, Jesus was Jewish, and all the 12 disciples were. And everybody that they encountered in Israel, they led them to become followers of Jesus. They were all Jews originally. Judaism had been their default setting. They'd been saturated with it. They'd been surrounded by it their entire lives. So this is a big paradigm shift for them. And some couldn't go there. And they wanted to maintain the status quo. And they put pressure on others to do the same. That's the Judaizers. And it would even put pressure on the church leaders. They wrestled with this. And Paul saw this. And he says in Galatians 2, uh, he, he opposes the hypocrisy that he saw in them. Galatians 2, verse 11, he says, When Cephas came to Antioch, Peter, uh, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when this group from James arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. They were pressurizing, and they could get quite hostile, as Paul experienced in their opposition. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. This was a lot of pressure that was being put on these people. But Paul's passion was for the gospel to be upheld, the true gospel. He goes on to say, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth, he was one of those, and not Gentile sinners, <laughs> not the sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He's going to repeat that again. We too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Say it again. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Just in verse 16, Paul tells us three times that no one is justified by following the law. And three times he emphasizes that it is by faith in Jesus that we are justified. What does that mean? It means to be declared righteous. So it's not earned, it's bestowed. It's God declaring you righteous. He's the judge, and you're in the courtroom, and he says, not guilty. Court is closed. Court adjourned. 
It's God's declaration of us to be righteous, which means to be made right with God, to be in right relationship with God. So it's all good between you guys. Sin gets in the way. Sin separates us from God. And God does the heavy lifting to deal with that. The cure for that is that God came to us in the person of Jesus, took that sin on himself, paid for it, took it out of the way so that now we can be connected to God. Can I get an amen, somebody? <laughs> this is good stuff. This is the gospel. This is what it's all about. This is what transformed Paul and what gave him this message that impelled him to the ends of the earth, said uh, that this, this gospel, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It's like a fire in my bones if I don't let it out. So, yeah, he confronts this hypocrisy and he emphasizes that it's by faith in Jesus that we are justified, made right with God, declared to be righteous, and this is huge. This is what the religious legalists could not stand because they're losing their control over people. You know, we're telling them they've got to follow all these laws and that's how we keep them in line. How are we going to keep them in line if they experience this freedom? They're just going to run wild. We're going to lose control. Shook these religious legalists up so much that they wanted to kill Paul. And they tried repeatedly, and they almost succeeded on a number of occasions. But Paul was able to survive and keep going by God's grace. So you know, the legalists believed that it was in keeping every part of the law that they were made righteous. They earned their righteousness. But Paul said, no, no, it's not earned. You can't earn it. It's by faith in Jesus that we are given righteousness. God will declare everyone who puts their trust in Jesus and what he accomplished by dying on the cross for our sins, everyone who trusts in what he has done will be declared righteous. That's amazing. That's earth-shattering truth. That shook up Paul's world. <laughs> that shook up the, the world, the ancient world there in uh, the Near East, and it set people free. Do you see how that sets you free from the slavery of following hundreds of picky rules? If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. So that's good news. That's shouting stuff. Amen? Amen. Can we give God a clap offering for that? Yeah. So Paul goes on to make this astounding statement which involves these seemingly contradictory ideas. Crucified with Christ and alive by faith. So here we get into that question. Okay, how does a instrument of torture and death lead to life? Paul explains, Galatians 2, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how he demonstrates his love. There's no greater love than for a man to give his life for, for his friends, and he calls us his friends. Isn't that amazing? I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. There we see the absolute crucial nature of the cross. The centerpiece of Christianity. Why do people wear crosses around their neck? Why do you wear an implement of torture and execution around your neck? Because it's a symbol of what God was willing to do to demonstrate his love for us and to get the sin problem out of the way, which was killing us, and to give us life because connection with God is life. God is the source of life. If we're disconnected from him, we're spiritually dead. 
If we're connected to him, we're alive in Christ. This is the gospel. So he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The Judaizers had elevated the law to idol status, taking the place of God. Paul says, I died to the law so that I might live for God. And how is this accomplished? It's accomplished by being crucified with Christ. What does that mean? It means when we trust in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, that means we are placed by God. We're placed in Christ. We're identifying with him. It's like God wraps us in a sparkly robe, uh, which is Jesus, which is glorious and beautiful and looks just like Jesus. So when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. We are made righteous in Christ. And his righteousness becomes ours. And we are identified with him in his death. So as Jesus died and was buried, so in Christ we die and are buried. We die to our old life, to the sinful domination how sin used to be able to control us, enslave us, and there was nothing we could do about it. Now that's not true anymore. In Christ, our old life is put to death and a new life is born. One that rises into new life in Christ. That's the picture of baptism. We're gonna be doing a baptism service on November 15. So if any of you wanna get in on that, come talk to me. It's a wonderful way to celebrate together, to have a pool party with Jesus and to see that uh, beautiful picture of going under the water is like dying in Christ and being buried. The old life passes away and coming up out of the water is like being resurrected in Christ like he was into new life, into freedom from the domination of sin and into a new way of living, which also means we're dead to the law. We're not under law, we're under grace. Paul says that in Christ we also die to the law, to the enslavement of keeping all the rules. Now we're set free to live by faith in Jesus, by the grace of God. So circumcision beats, uh, I mean, uh, crucifixion beats circumcision. <laughs> All right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that your crucifixion sets us free from the law of sin and death. And we get to celebrate this today with another physical picture of a spiritual truth. We're going to engage in communion. Communion pictures this truth physically with bread and wine or juice. The bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus, which was broken on the cross to pay for our sins. The blood, the, the juice or the wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus, which was poured out for us to pay for sin and take it out of the way. So we get to remember what Jesus did to demonstrate his love for us because he loves us perfectly as we are right now. And he loves us too much to let us stay there. He calls us like he called the Apostle Paul to leave the old life behind, the life of being dominated by sin, and to move forward into new life, into this resurrection life, into life walking together with God, following Jesus, and being filled with the Spirit so that we can walk in newness of life. So communion pictures are receiving that by faith. Yeah, Jesus, I want what you offer. I want this forgiveness. I want your life. I want that in me. I want that to be part of the cells of my spiritual being. And we can. Communion is a picture of how this, this is freely offered to everyone. You can respond to Jesus by saying, yes, by faith I receive you and you can picture that physically by receiving the communion elements and by that remembering what Jesus did for each one of us. All we need to do is receive it. So 
if that would be you, if you would be picturing that reality, that spiritual reality of receiving by faith what Jesus offers to you in his life and death on the cross and his resurrection to bring you into right relationship with God, to be declared righteous, to be justified. If you, by faith, receive that, you can picture that by taking these elements of communion, if that's true of you. If that's not where you are, if you're still looking into this Christianity thing or you're trying to figure out what uh, it means to be in a relationship with God through Jesus, please don't feel any pressure to do this. You can just watch and see how this is acted out like a play in front of you. So uh, I'd like to welcome the, uh, the people who are bringing the elements forward, and I'd like to invite the music team to come forward and to lead us in a song uh, as we're preparing to present these elements and to receive them. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his followers, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new agreement between God and man. This is demonstration of my love for you. Receive this and remember what I've done for you. When you take this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's do that together. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to do this, to die for us to come into our space to, to limit yourself, to let go of your prerogatives as God and allow yourself to be limited into one body, the body of Jesus. And then to allow that body to be broken for us. You didn't have to. You created the world. You could have destroyed it with a word but you allowed yourself to die for our sakes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. There's nothing we could do to ever repay that. And you have made it clear through your word, through the Apostle Paul, that there's nothing we can do to earn that. We just have to receive it by faith. So that's what we do. We respond to you. We're so thankful for your gospel. This is good news. And we don't have to earn it. We don't have to perform perfectly in order to earn your love, your acceptance. We can just receive it. And so we symbolize that by taking these elements. And thank you that you meet us here in this space because you have said wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. So you're here. Thank you. We welcome you. We worship you. This is part of our worship of you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.